Well, thank you very much, Rafael. Um, it's always, I've got to say thank you for inviting me because it's always wonderful to be in Mexico. The last time I was here, uh, I had just become a doctor. I passed my Viva the day before I traveled here. Thankfully, I passed. Um, and this time, uh, I've recently just got married. Uh, my wife is not very happy that I'm here and she isn't, because she's never been. But I get to see you come, so uh, I'm happy. You should have mentioned that. Well, I, I, I did. Did you not? I did just now. <laughs> so um, who's to say what will happen next time I come? You know, children. yeah, children, children's next one. <laughs> so give it five years. Um, well, who knows? Who knows? Anyway, so my talk is on power spectrum methods for stochastic reaction diffusion equations on growing domains. A bit of a mouthful there. Um, and so essentially what my talk is going to be about is essentially peeling away what these, all of these things mean and then slamming them all together at the end. So I'm going to start off talking about reaction diffusion equations, both deterministic and stochastic. In particular, I'm going to be focusing on Turing patterns, which uh, you saw this morning because Raphael showed you Turing burning in fire, which we all enjoyed. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking about uh, power spectrum methods. So the, uh, we'll be using Fourier transforms to really understand when patterns exist, either temporally or spatially. Then I will be defining what it means to be on a growing domain, uh, stochastically, and then finally throwing them all together to see what growth can do in terms of uh, how it will affect Turing patterns and how the stochastic will affect everything overall. So let's start at the beginning, Turing patterns. Um, as you saw this morning, Turing patterns are great uh, at producing uh, patterns on the skin pigmentation. Um, they're also very good at producing patterns uh, for, say, limb development. So, as, as uh, Raphael mentioned, you have five, five digits. You know, you can have a Turing pattern that suggests where your digits will be produced. But there is a problem with Turing patterns, and that's the robustness problem. The robustness problem is that if you start from very slightly different initial conditions, you can end up in very different uh, final solutions. So that's what I'm going to show you now. Here are two initial conditions, okay? They're pretty much identical. The only difference is here, this little bit is lower than over there. Other than that, pretty much the same initial condition. Now I'm going to run the exact same uh, reaction diffusion equation on top of these and see what happens. As you can see, very quickly, they diverge into two very different final sim solutions. So here we have three peaks, here we have three and a half. Now, if you're dealing with animal skin pigmentation or, say, fingerprints, you don't mind the robustness problem because you want that individuality. You want to have small changes in the, in the initial conditions to produce big changes later on because you want that difference. But if you're talking about producing digits or limbs, you want to be able to make sure you can produce five fingers reassuredly every time. Because to say that we all start from the same initial conditions when we're, uh, when, when, when developing as an embryo is a bit far-fetched. Biology is, uh, is uh, slave to a number of sources of noise, and it has to work against those noises or use those types of noises to actually, to actually to be able to produce the patterns that need uh, consistently and robustly. Before I did my DPhil, uh, a guy, Edmund Crampin, really did some really, really nice work in that he showed that you can uh, remove the robustness problem if you put Turing patterns on growing domains. And that's what you're seeing here. So you're seeing the exact same information but in two different ways. And I need to really explain what you're seeing here because the simulations you're going to see are all of the type on the left. So if we understand that, you hopefully will be understanding everything. The one on the right, you see the domain growth. So out here, this is nothing. Here is the domain. It grows exponentially, and here we have no pattern. We form a pattern of three humps. That splits into six humps. That splits into 12 humps. And if we kept growing the domain, it would go 12, 24, uh, 24 times 2, whatever that is, 48. I'm a mathematician, aren't I? <laughs> no, 12 times 2, 24, 48, yeah. You just keep doubling it, exponentially growing. Edmund Crampin managed to show that analytically, you'll always get the doubling, and it's robust. OK, great. What you're seeing here is the time evolution of this. So here we're around about 7,000 seconds. It splits into six. And then as the time increases, it will get to about 14,000 seconds and then split again into 12. But the difference in this one is that the space isn't growing. 
This is how we actually solve this system. We don't solve it on the growing domain because that's a little bit too difficult. What we do is we take the domain and we apply a transformation. We map it back to the stationary domain 0, 1. That transformation then feeds into the uh, diffusion and the kinetics. And so, although the space isn't changing, the kinetics and the diffusion are now time dependent. And it's as though they're uh, being scaled as though they were on a growing domain. Okay? So, what the simulations I'm going to be showing you, they're all going to be seem seemingly to be on a fixed domain. But all that's different is that I've mapped them back to the stationary domain instead of showing you the domain that's growing. But it's exactly the same information. I just haven't mapped it to the growing domain. So this was great. Anyway, we, uh, deterministically, we can get rid of the robustness problem if we've got a growing domain. And embryos grow. Factually accurate. So we, we seem to have got rid of this problem. So what my question was, well, how do sources of noise affect this? Or is this uh, stochasticity, uh, Turing patterns or growing domains, robust against stochasticity? That was my question. But in order to answer that, I needed to develop a, some of new techniques. Firstly, we needed to look at stochastic Turing patterns, definitions of growth, and also the Fourier transforms that we're going to be talking about. So, the first thing we need to do is talk about a stochastic description of the chemical reaction equations. Okay, so previously when we've been talking about deterministic descriptions, you've had a state and you've said, well, what's the probability, I'm, what's the state I'm in and how does that change over time? And you, you normally use um, the law of mass action and you have conservation equations. So you say the, state, the rate of change of the state that I'm in is equal to uh, things moving into that state minus things moving out of that state. Very simple. It's the rate of creation minus the rate of degradation. Very simple. However, because we're talking about probabilistic systems now, we can't talk about being in an, an, an exact state. We can only talk about a probability distribution and how that evolves. Other than that, the idea is exactly the same. You're still using a conservation idea. You're say, instead of saying you're in a state, you're saying, well, what's the probability of being in that state? So the rate of change of probability of being in the state is equal to the probability of moving into the state minus the probability of moving out of the state. In terms of the mathematics, it's just a simple equation like this, and it's called the chemical master equation. Here is the probability dis uh, distribution P. The rate of change of that is to state U at time T given initial conditions U0 at time 0 is equal to the probability we move into state U minus the probability we move out of state U. Very simple. But the chemical master equation is a pig to work with. It's usually highly nonlinear, and if it's not nonlinear, it's boring. So, in the most interesting cases, we really can't do much with it. So, instead of working with the full complexity of the uh, chemical master equation, what I'm going to look at is the weak noise limit. The weak noise limit is essentially uh, what I'm saying is I've got a, I don't have a deterministic system, but I have a large number of particles that I'm very close to being deterministic. My main uh, dynamics that I'm going to see are pretty much going to be what I expect, but I'm going to have noise around that. Now, the way to understand this is that let's say you have 10 particles and you've got a reaction that creates particles. Then when you, whenever that reaction fires, you're creating a 10% of your population ag again. And that's a, quite a big proportion of your population. So any noise in that will uh, cause a huge uh, proportion uh, stochasticity. However, if you have a million particles and you create one, then that's a tiny amount. So any noise in that reaction won't matter so much. And that's what the case I'll be looking at. So to illustrate what I'm talking about, what I'm going to show you here are two uh, simulations of just diffusion. Okay, so the red line is the deterministic solution to the diffusion equation. You'll just see it diffuse out like you normally would. In this simulation, I've got 1,000 particles diffusing. And now so I'm looking at the stochastic system. So they're discrete particles, and I'm tracking each individual reaction of them moving left and right throughout the domain. 1,000 particles. In this simulation, 
I've got 100,000 particles, okay? So 100 times more. And hopefully you'll be able to see the difference quite quickly. So as I say, this line here, that's the deterministic solution. Over here with the 1,000 particles, you can see this blue line. That's the stochastic simulation. On average, it matches the deterministic solution quite well. But you can see there's a huge amount of noise around that. Over here, you might not even be able to see the blue line because it's so close. 100,000 particles means it's very, very close to that deterministic limit. So what this is, it's, it's essentially using this idea of justifying um, the continuum limit. When you write down a partial differential equation, you're assuming that you can use a continuous description of your species. But when you're dealing with atoms and small numbers of proteins, you can't have 0.5 of a protein. You've got one protein, two protein, three protein, four protein. You don't have that continuous limit. And so it's very much more important to deal with the individual interactions when you have a low number than when you have a really high number. Okay? And so this is the situation I'm going to be dealing, dealing with. I've got a large number, but not, not, not quite large enough to be completely deterministic. Yes, you're talking about Fokker-Planck Yes, I'm going to get to that in a second. So, to encapsulate that idea, we say that my population, U, that will be the discrete population, so I'll have 100 particles, 200 particles, 250 particles, whatever. It will be the discrete exact integer number of particles that I have. And I say that that is going to be equal to this omega, which is the system size, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, times uh, phi. Phi is the mean field limit. That is the solution to the deterministic equations that you'd normally work with. That's the PDE solution. This omega is the scaling between them. It's the system size, so it's the number of particles you're dealing with. The bigger omega is, the closer you are to the mean field. Okay? So if I ignored this bit, all I would be saying is that I'm scaling between the number of particles and a density. But what I'm saying is that it's looking pretty much like the mean field, plus a noise term. Whatever the action will be, it will look like the mean field, plus a noise at a lower order. So here is the square root of omega, which is a lower order to omega. So omega is going to be big. We define a new probability distribution, pi. So previously we've been working with p, which is the probability distribution of u. We define a new one, pi, which is the probability distribution of eta. And then you do what all mathematicians and physicists, physicists love to do. You linearize the hell out of it. You put this guy into your, the chemical master equation, and you linearize. The first order term is the deterministic equation. It's going to be the equation you would write down normally using the law of mass action. It's exactly what you would expect. But that's the first order, and that tells you exactly what I was saying. The first order is the mean field. The second order is the Fokker-Planck equation, this thing that Raphael was just talking about. Again, this is what, uh, this is, what is controlling the uh, distribution pi. This is telling you how the stochastics are uh, evolving around your mean field. Now, this thing was hell to work with. This thing isn't much better because it's hu it has a huge dimension. This, uh, thing, this k is essentially how many species you have. So I'm thinking about spatially... Um, a distributed particle, so I'm splitting my uh, space into boxes. So I'm going to have a large K. So if I have to have, I, I can solve maybe two dimensions, three dimensions. I certainly can't solve 100 dimensional equations. So what we do is we don't work with this again. We work with the covariances. And the way we get the covariances is that we multiply by e to L and e to M for all L and M, and we take an average. So we've gone from this equation down to these equations, and now these are getting to something we can work with. These are linear in, in uh, their arguments, and it's just a simple ODE now. The final piece, of, well, not quite the final piece of the puzzle, the penultimate piece of the puzzle are the Fourier transforms that we're going to be using. So as I say, what I'm going to be dealing with is I want to understand when pattern formation is occurring. And temporal and Fourier, uh, spatial Fourier transforms are perfect at telling you when patterning exists. And these are exactly what we've got here. So this is the temporal transform, this is the spatial Fourier transform. And it, what it's telling you is that if there's a peak in the, the, the spectra of these things, then it's telling you that there is a, an excited frequency. 
If we have a peak in the temporal frequency, that says that your solution will oscillate in time. If you have a peak in the spatial frequency, it says that you're going to have an oscillating pattern in space. And the peaks in the frequency simply tell you how, if it's time, it tells you how often you'd expect the oscillations. And if it's space, it'll tell you the frequency or the wavelength of the, the uh, pattern you'd expect. So just to show you all this stuff works, here is the power spectra of diffusion. I mean, this result here isn't actually anything interesting. It's just uh, sort of a tester example to show you everything works. So all I've done is I've taken my diffusion equation. You know, your d by dt is equal to d by dx squared of, uh, of a, uh, a species. And then I've taken the Fourier transform. This is the analytical version of it. And here is the numerical version of it. So what, in this one, what I've done is I've simulated diffusion 1,000 times stochastically, and then taken the average spectra. Here, this one, this just comes from the complete analytical description that we've just developed. And as you can see, they're, they're pretty much exactly the same. These do tell you about what you would expect from diffusion. You can actually interpret these back. What we see here is a big peak around 0, 0. So what it's saying is that you expect no spatial patterns and no temporal patterns. That's exactly what diffusion is. There, it, it's memoryless and has, doesn't have any correlations. It simply wipes patterns out. So here's just a toy example to show you that it's working, essentially. There's nothing very interesting in this picture, just that it works. So now let's go to the final piece of the puzzle. We need a form of growth that we can talk about stochastically. So I've discretized my space into boxes. Each of these boxes are going to have some particles. They're going to be moving around, diffusing. They're going to be reacting in their boxes. Uh, and there may be more than one species, of course, because they can interact between the two different species. How do we define a growing uh, mechanism? Well, one possible way is to, at some point, say, I'm going to have a growth. I pick a box at random. Let's say the jth box. I split it, so I insert a new box. I renumber all the other ones, so this one now becomes j plus 2, j plus 3, etc. And all the particles that were in box j, I split to give, me, uh, to give me a roughly even distribution between the two. The way you actually split the particles doesn't really matter, but it, uh, as long as you're consistent. But there's a problem. This is a certainly a way of defining growth. But there's a problem in that we can't use the weak noise limit with this definition. Because as I was talking earlier, the weak noise limit is that every reaction changes your, changes your population by a very small amount. So if you have a creation reaction, you're creating one particle in a million. Here, what we're doing is a growth reaction that changes half your population. And in no sense of the word small, even for physicists, is half small compared to the rest of the population. So it's, a half is not a perturbation of, a, of one. Okay? So we can't use this idea as growth. What we can do instead is essentially use an analogous idea to what Edmund Crampin did. What he did was he took the growing domain, an Eulerian description, and mapped it back to give us a Lagrangian description. And that's essentially all I'm going to do. I have my domain. I split it up into boxes of size delta L. They are my Lagrangian boxes. Now, below each Lagrangian box, I imagine I have a population of Eulerian boxes, okay? So this is sort of a meta or hypothetical population. And when a growth occurs, I add one of these small boxes in, okay? And so we're back to that idea of, it, of each growth reaction being a small perturbation. So if I, if I have a growth reaction, I put a small box in, that becomes a small perturbation around the Lagrangian box. And so we can use all the uh, techniques that we've just developed. Uh, just, so, oh, no, I'm doing it on diffusion, just reactions you can throw in. I'm going to throw reactions in in a moment. I'm just doing it for diffusion. <laughs> just the question is how, how this compares with the thing we did, Philip and Pablo. Uh, is, is replacing the Laplacian for uh, the Beltrami. Yeah, but that was on um, growing domains. Uh, but that was on non-flat domains. You had weird curves. Uh, 
Oh, it could have flat or not flat. But yeah, well, if it's flat, then it breaks down to the same thing. The, the only reason why you were choosing Laplace Le, 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 Le Beltrami is that you had um, strange curves going on that you wanted to use as um, surfaces of revolution, weren't you, if I remember rightly? Well, no, I mean, could use it in flat domains as well. But then it would break down just to diffusion, I mean, wouldn't it? use it in the square, in the plane. But, that, but then the Laplace Beltrami is just the normal Laplacian. Uh, no, no, except that you have a, a growth function. A function depends on time. The difference here is that you're, you're going to be looking at small numbers, whereas we're looking in the... In the continuum limit. In the continuum, the continuum limit. In the continuum limit, yeah. Well, it would be interesting to see, actually, seeing if I can use some of these ideas on more uh, uh, weird curves to actually use surfaces as a revolution, uh, because that would be, it, it would move it to a new dimension, essentially. So, and, and see if you can get an, an, analogues of the Laplace Beltrami, but that's a good point. But no, essentially all I'm doing here is defining a way of giving stochastic growth a mean field limit. That's, that's essentially all this is. As it, essentially, most of my defills were spent on this slide. Three years for that slide. Isn't it nice? Appreciate it. So anyway, let's check. again, this is just a fusion, no reactions. I'll put reactions in a second. This is just a fusion on a non-grain domain. As you can see, it does what diffusion you expect it to do. There's no patterns. You get fluctuations, so at some point you have higher numbers, you have lower numbers. But on the whole, they're just purely fluctuations that occur very quickly. Now let's put this on an exponentially growing domain, okay? Very quickly you can see patterns start to nucleate. And I should say that I'm using the word pattern here not in the Turing sense. So normally when we say the word pattern we're talking about uh, nice well-defined peaks that have uh, well-defined uh, uh, wavelengths. Here I'm just talking about a pattern as a state which is far removed from the uniform for a long time. Okay, that's, that's what I'm using the word pattern to mean. And hopefully you can see this does not look like this anymore. And it's easy to understand why this occurs. The, state, the space is growing exponentially. So the, at the beginning of the, the simulation, the space is small. And so your particles can happily diffuse left and right. But stochasticity means that you won't have a uniform population. At some point, you'll have more particles over here than over there, and they'll, they'll keep jumping around. But because it's growing exponentially, there will come a time when the box is growing faster than the, the particles can diffuse out of it. So imagine you're in this room, and you're trying to get to the door, but the door is moving faster than you can run. You're trapped in the room. So when that time point comes, the particles can no longer move out of the box that they're in. So the pattern that exists gets frozen. And that's what you're seeing here. It's just simply that at some time point down here, this was the distribution that occurred, and now the space is growing so fast that the particles can't escape the box that they're in. But there's still normal diffusion, right? Yes, it's just normal it's diffusion. It's a trick of the, of, the, of the picture. Because any, oh, say one of the, each one of these columns, in reality, in real space, it's, it's, it's very big, yes. It's a lot. It's very big. But all of these are the same size, these yeah. boxes. Yeah. So That's this one will have slightly more than this one. This one will have slightly less. And so these patterns will be there. It, it's, yeah. If you took an average of many, many simulations, that pattern would be wiped out. But for any individual one, you will, you will get this frozen distribution. All right. So yes, you're quite right. As I was saying, yes, this is mapped back, but it should be, it should it should be very big. Yes, yeah. So it's not that you're stopping diffusion? No, no, I'm not stopping diffusion at all. Diffusion is occurring. It's just the box is growing so fast that it can't escape. And in fact, if you look at a fringe with the same width, the picture on the, uh, down there will be roughly similar to the picture up there. No, well, like I say, no, because these are able to jump in and out. This, is, this, this isn't growing at all. No, but they will be able to jump in and out within a fringe of a given size. I uh, don't quite understand. So, because yeah. each of these strips right. is the same size if you mapped it. No, you're not looking at a, a strip, but you're looking at a portion of the strip with the same length, actual length, actual width. Then you will look diffusion in the same way. 
or not? Yes, I but you said, Thomas, if you took one of those stripes and looked at it like at the top picture, <coughs> you would just have diffusion on the stripe. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, so, so, yeah. If you were looking inside that box, inside yes, the yes, the yes, yes. Sorry, you're, yes, you're quite correct. So I, w I wasn't quite understanding. If you, yes, if you, the, yes, exactly. If you, if you just looked inside here, yeah. that would look like that. Right. Yes, yes. Um, good. So, just to go back to what the power spectra tells us, um, it tells us that we should be expecting patterns. So here are the, here's the analytical power spectra. Here is the uh, computer power spectra of a thousand simulations of this thing. Again, you can see that they correspond extremely well. But what it tells us is that if this was pure diffusion on a non-growing domain, all of the uh, all of the um, uh, the modes will have the same power, because diffusion is essentially uh, white noise, and white noise um, is defined that all the all the modes should have the same power. It's that's how it's defined. But here we're seeing that zero to twenty modes they have reduced power, and from twenty onwards they all have. Uh, a lot larger power than 0 to 20. And so it's suggesting that, yes, you should be getting um, pattern formation, actually, well, essentially. But like I say, not pattern formation in the Turing sense. It's that your system should be far removed from a uh, homogeneous steady state. So stochastic space. So that was deterministic space. Now we're going to talk about stochastic space. So now our boxes that we've discretized into can now grow at different lengths. Uh, different, they, can, they can be different lengths because they're each, in, they're each growing stochastically. The problem with the way we define growth is that it has a mean field limit, but it means that diffusion is now not uniquely defined in terms of its jumping rates. What does that mean? Let's just suppose at some point I have three boxes dis distributed such that I've got a small box, a medium-sized box, and a large box. What is the rate that I jump out of this box? Well, here I've just defined two ways that you could define the jumping rate, left and right. I'm not saying that either one is good. I'm not saying either one is better where a better um, uh, Justified. All I'm saying are these are two different possible ways I can define it, and then I'm going to show you that these both give you the same mean field. So here is midpoint to midpoint diffusion, and here what I'm saying is that a, a particle can be said to be have moved from this box to either the left or the right if it moves from the midpoint here to the midpoint here. That's the rate. So it's the rate that uh, the particles can get from here to here. In the approximate midpoint to midpoint, I say that the particle has left this one at a rate that it takes it to run this entire length. Because if a particle is in here and it runs the length ni, then it certainly will escape either side. So here are the rates that you get based on these two definitions. Midpoint to midpoint dif uh, diffusion and approximate midpoint to midpoint diffusion. Don't try and understand what, what's going on behind there. All you need to see is that when I take the continuum limit, limit, let this theta tend to infinity, all of these break down to the same thing, which is dl over n squared. So just going back up here, this ni is related to this small ni by theta. I'm let theta go to infinity. This stochastic term drops out. So I'm taking the mean field and saying that this is going to be looking like ni. Also, all of these are being controlled identically, and it's only the stochastics that are differentiating between them. So in that mean field, the i's disappear. So n becomes small n, the i's disappear, and in each case, all of these jumping rates change into dl over n squared. In the mean field, these two descriptions of diffusion are equivalent. Okay? These are only two. There are an infinite number of ways I could have defined that jumping rate and they would all be equivalent in the mean field. Now, this is something we haven't actually looked more into. Um, as, as Philip was saying this morning, it's very important. What, quite often, people have worked top down. You define diffusion, and you carry on. But what he was saying is that you really need to understand your microscopic detail of how your, your uh, particles are moving, and then derive the mean field from that. Here I'm saying it's even more important because if you don't know what's going on on the microscopic level, then your macroscopic level can be the same. 
Now you might say, well, if these are going to be the same in the mean field, then surely they will give roughly the same simulation results. Sadly not. So here we have midpoint to midpoint diffusion. These are all on growing domains linearly at the same rate. This is diffusion. There's no patterns in this. All you get is fluctuations. But over here, in approximate midpoint to midpoint diffusion, you can start seeing that you get prolonged uh, regions where you have higher population, regions where you have lower population. And it's easy to understand where these come from. Let's go back to the previous simulation, uh, previous uh, slide. Suppose my box is larger than those two surrounding it. I'm currently in a box that's big, other than the, the two next to it. My ni, my length of my box, is bigger than ni minus 1 and ni plus 1. This means that the probability in this situation of jumping into the box is higher than the probability of jumping out of the box because it's only based on the length of the box that I'm in. In this case, the, the diffusion rates, the jumping rates, are averaged out uh, with the size of the box in ni minus 1 and ni plus 1. So the fact that I'm, my NI box is the biggest is sort of averaged out, so you get less of effect. Even though my box is biggest, it doesn't matter because the effect of the boxes either side are averaging against it. So that's why you see that you can have prolonged time uh, where you, your, your populations are maximal here, but not over here. So, uh, as I was saying, we haven't really looked into this much further than saying, oh, there could be lots of ways of defining diffusion. So if anyone's interested in maybe looking into what the correct definition is, correct in whatever sense that means, then I'd be happy to talk more about what all this gumph means. So conclusions of just this part where we've been dealing with diffusion and developing all the techniques that we need. We produced a new description of growth that can be analysed rigorously. That is simply meaning that we've got a, a form of growth that we can take the mead field limit of. Great. Growth can cause... Yep, sorry. Uh, physics is we are accustomed to see that uh, diffusion comes from the central limit theory. Yes. So whenever you have a normal distribution, yep. the stochastic process, when, I mean, is Gaussian, yep. then you have you derive the diffusion equation. Yes. So in any other case, you cannot. Right. 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 So, I didn't understand what you meant when you have to look carefully. Well, it's, it's, How it's, are you finding diffusion? Well, like I say, it's coming down to these jumping rates. So, all, all my particles are in the boxes, and I'm saying you can jump left at this rate, you can jump right at this rate. And in the mean field, when I send my theta, when I make my space continuous, all of these things fall down to the same rate. Yeah. So, you can't say which one. Well, I can't at the moment, because I've not worked much more than this on it. I can't say which one of these is more correct than the other. Because all I know is that I want this at the mean field. This is, this is correct in the mean field. This is diffusion. Yeah. But since bo both of these can give the same macroscopic limit, how do I know which one to use? But the thing is that you are, you are defining diffusion only in terms of the mean field. Yes, yes, no, that's completely correct. Yeah. If you look at the statistical properties of a distributive problem, then perhaps you can distinguish between one and zero. Yes, no, I, I completely agree with you. I just haven't done it. <laughs> no, you're, you're quite correct. I mean, that, that's perfectly true. Because what I've said, and this is the, the entire point, I'm saying that whatever I do, I want to get to the mean field. I'm defining everything in terms of my mean field equation. But what you're saying is that we really need to be looking at the, the statistical to really pin down what's happening here. And I completely agree. Um, so, conclusions. Growth can cause patterning. If you, like I say, if you grow quick enough, your pattern can be frozen. Now, let's put some reactions in. So, first question. Does do stochastics stop Turing patterns from existing? Thankfully, as we can see here, no. So uh, the lines are the deterministic solutions, the bar charts are the stochastic solutions. As you can see, the stochastic equations do pretty well. Um, there are, you know, it can overshoot a little bit or undershoot, but on the whole, they look like the Turing patterns that they should. But at the beginning I said we had this robustness problem, that different initial conditions can lead to different final solutions. 
It's even worse when you're dealing with stochastic problems because the same initial condition can lead to different outcomes. You no longer have that deterministic uh, link between initial condition and final solution. All of, these equations, all of these simulations were generated from the same initial condition. And I had to pick the correct deterministic response. I had to try and find initial conditions that would give me the correct final deterministic response. But since we already have a robustness problem, adding more to that problem doesn't really matter. The thing is that stochasticity actually helps us with the Turing pattern a little. And so let me explain how it actually helps. It helps in two ways. The first way is that Turing patterns also have another problem known as the fine-tuning problem. It, Turing patterns exist in very small parameter regions. And so to be within that parameter region, you have to say that your, your animal skin pattern is very well fine-tuned. Stochasticity can actually widen that parameter region. So what you're seeing here is actually a simulation that pre produces patterns. So as you can see, is a peak here, a peak here, a peak, peak. Interestingly, the polarity of the peak changes, but you still get peaks forming. But deterministically, there would be no pattern here. If I did this deterministically, all you'd get was a homogeneous steady state. So your uh, stochasticity is actually growing the parameter region that these things exist over. Good point number one. Good point number two is that it actually speeds up the time of the pattern formation. How does that occur? Well, deterministically, if you start at the steady state, you will stay at the steady state. Because although it's unstable, the steady state is still a critical point. It's still an answer to the, uh, the equation. So if you, if you start at the steady state, you will stay there. Any small perturbation will then take time to grow. So the smaller the perturbation, the longer the time for the pattern to grow will occur. But when you're dealing with stochastics, the pattern's always trying to push you away from the steady state. And so it makes you go into the pattern much quicker. We tried to use this uh, to remove um, some problems with Turing's and patterns and delays. It didn't quite work. If you're interested in delays and Turing patterns, talk to me later. Um, we, can, we can talk about that. But yeah, so, the, so although we have a bit more of a robustness problem than we had, we gained two advantages. So, on the whole, we, we've made a gain. Um, and this actual polarity switching, so peak to peak to peak to peak to peak to peak, is actually very interesting. And if I've got time at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about that, because um, one of the students uh, in the CMB at the moment, Linus Schumacher, he did a, did a bit of work on this, and he came up with some interesting uh, results. But carrying on, very quickly, we, we should ask this question, does growth give us back the robustness? Can we, does growth allow us to peak split again? And deterministically, we can see we get one peak going into two peaks, and that will go into four peaks. But sadly, stochastically, we don't have that same uh, mechanism. We have one peak forming, and then we'll get one and a half peak forming. This picture has deterministic growth. This picture has stochastic growth. So the peak doubling mechanism is just too fragile to withstand the noise that we're putting into this. But if we look at the power spectra, we gain a new idea of what could be happening or what might help us produce a robust pattern. So here are the power spectra. And we start off having the mode 2 being the having the highest power. What this means is that we have a mode 2. This is mode 2. So whenever I refer to a mode number, it's the number of half peaks. So this is mode 2. This is mode 3 because it's one and a half peaks. Essentially, whenever I say mode n, think of n minus 2 peaks. N, n divided by 2 peaks, sorry. So we started off with mode 2 being the highest power. We see mode 2. Then, as the domain grows, mode 2 starts to slow down its growth and eventually starts to decrease. And mode 3 will take over as the dominant mode. That's what we see. Mode 2 changing into mode 3. Interestingly, around about 4,000 seconds that occurs, that crossover occurs, and this transition occurs around 4,000 seconds. So what we're seeing here in the power spectra is this idea that as the domain grows, the, the dominant mode increases consecutively. 
it'll go two, three, four, five, blah, de blah, de blah. So maybe that is what could be happening in the stochastic system. Instead of having a peak doubling, we'll just get consecutive increasing. So instead of getting two, four, eight, 16, we'll get one, two, three, four, five. Which is even better if you think about it, because how do you produce five fingers with a period doubling? You can get two, you can get four, you can get eight. But five is a little bit difficult. If you're increasing consecutively, you get five fingers and then you stop growing. So, how do we can calculate a, a, analytically exactly which frequencies are being excited. And so I've, what I've done is I've jumped a huge amount of algebra to get to this point. This tells us, this, uh, this y tells us which frequencies are being excited. So it's just a simple quadratic in y. You can solve it uh, for the, uh, the limits of this parabola. And you find that in the limit when you've made your space continuous, you, these are your limits here. These are the limits on the uh, frequencies which are excited. And this is incredible because these are exactly the same frequencies that the deterministic Turing patterns are exciting. So the noise is exciting the exact same frequencies that the deterministic Turing pattern is exciting. Again, another reason why the noise is pushing you into your Turing pattern even earlier, because you've got, now got two effects pushing you into it. But this is only true when you send k to infinity. If you remember, k was the number of boxes I have. So if I make my space continuous, I send k to infinity. And so you can view this in two ways. The first way is that if you want your space to act like it's continuous, then you can derive a, an inequality of how many boxes, how big k has to be, so it acts like it's continuous, even though it's discrete. Or you can look at it another way. Say you're doing an experiment where you know your space is actually a discrete case and it has a, a definite wavelength in there. Then you can change k to be a finite number and then what you'll get is that there will be uh, new frequencies that the stochasticity is exciting on its own. This is what's shown in this picture. So this triangle here shows you the exact frequencies that the deterministic Turing patterns are excited. So when your length of your system is 1, you'll have uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. They're, they're the modes that should be excited. And if you have k equals 25 or 50 boxes, even 100 boxes, it, there's no real difference there. But let's go up to 1.5. Here, if you've got 50 or 100 boxes, again, there's no difference. But if you have 25 boxes, you, you discretize your domain into 25 boxes, you're going to start having modes of 15, 16, and maybe even 17 that weren't there before. And again, here's another point that we haven't really investigated. How do these new modes that are stochastically amplified work or counteract the Turing modes? Is it able to visualize these modes? Are they stable? Um, do the Turing ones just simply wipe them out? We don't know. I've not looked into that. Again, something someone else might want to look into. I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost. Sorry, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so we'll go back. Where did you see two? Yeah. Where you? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> it is that uh, this has to do with, uh, with the discretization of your boxes. Yes, so you have a domain, and the way you'd normally solve it is you discretize it into a certain number of boxes, yeah. and then you uh, use, a, say, a, an Euler stepping scheme to solve diffusion. So you're saying that your box is smaller than the frequency or the wavelength I have to excite. It, it doesn't get excited, but it could be excited by noise. Yes, like no, essentially, yes. Um, if you have enough boxes then your, that you can derive through the inequality, then your space will essentially be acting as though it was continuous. So you'll be able to get all the modes that you expect to get. However, if your domain is too coarsely, but I, you may not have, like I say, in certain experiments, you don't want your space to be continuous. You may actually have definite cells in there. They may be talking to one another, but they have a definite space, spatial scale associated to them. And in that case, the noise is generating modes that you normally wouldn't see. But as for what those modes do, not looked into. There's an open problem there. Okay? Yeah? So that's the main point of your talk? Uh, th that's, the, that's one of the points. Um, so, uh, well, uh, just going back, we can, because we can calculate the exact 
modes that are coming through, we can see that they're increasing consecutively. You expect two, three, four, five, six. So maybe that's what will happen. So let's simulate the system for longer and see what happens. And in this one, you see you get a peak at mode two, mode three, mode four, mode five, mode six, mode seven, mode eight. Fantastic. It increases consecutively. However, in this one, two, three, four, five, seven. Oh dear. Two, three, four, six. Oh dear. It tries, it really tries to increase consecutively because every time a new mode is available, the noise tries to push you off into the new trajectory. But it isn't consistent. And that's what this, this is my favorite graph of my entire thesis. Three and a half years, and this is, this is my million dollar picture. This is what I love. And what this is doing is it's tracking the dominant mode over time of 100 simulations. So essentially what it's doing is it's saying the probability, well, based on 100 simulations, of being in these modes over time. So initially, for the first, say, 5,000 time units, you're 98% chance of being in mode two, whilst you've got about 2% well, chance of being in mode three. And as you can see, these evolve. So 98%, 96%, uh, 95%, 90, well, that's about 85%, and so on. And you can see that as more modes destabilize, the probability will decrease, and you start getting more variation between where, what the pattern will do. However, it really tries to maintain this consecutive increase, because the most thing you're likely to do is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, blah, de blah, de blah. But as you continue, it's just that these spurious modes start gaining more and more more weight, and it just can't maintain it as well as, uh, as you would like. But this is on a uniformly growing domain. It's like you've got a rubber band and you're stretching it. All the points are growing, either stochastically or deterministically. What about if we only grow apically? If we only grow at one side, then you're restricting where the new peak, peaks can be added. And this is a great way of actually producing a robust uh, simulation. This is what we'll see here. Once the pattern has formed, it freezes, and it's only at the edges where the new peaks can be inserted. So what I'm saying here is this is a potential way of generating a robust pattern of any mode that you like. You have apical growth and any Turing reaction system you like. Because it's growing apically, the centre pattern will freeze and all the peaks will come in from the side. So, just to wrap up the conclusions on this part of the talk, noise excites the same modes as the Turing system if, yours, if your space is dis discretized enough. If it's too coarse, you start getting spurious modes. Pattern transitions are not robust on a uniformly growing domain. If you have an apically growing domain, you reduce, you isolate the region where peaks can be inserted, and so they insert one by one. So you get an increase, a consecutive increase in the pattern, uh, and so you do get a robust pattern. And finally, there is a limit on the coarsity of the domain if you want it to act like a continuous system, and that's what you derive from the other inequality. I Again. Sorry, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. So, That's right. But it, you have two ways to conserve the wavelength as the domain grows in a Turing system. And one is the splitting of the, the mode, of the pattern. Yep. And the other is insertion. Insertion, of yes. New. So you're talking about both things. Yeah, both things. It, it really doesn't make a difference that much. Because if you, as. Um, this is, the, oh, this is the Schnackenberg system, and actually if we go back, to, uh, I'll, I'll show you one in a minute. The Schnackenberg system normally likes to actually split, split yes. but it's so delicate, the splitting, that the noise simply makes it impossible to achieve. So, um, so instead, instead the insertion occurs. Yeah, so you're saying that noise actually prevents the splitting? It, because it's, because it's, so, it, it's, it's so fragile, the splitting. It, it, it's rather inserts than splits. Um, so I've got, just got a few minutes final left. I'll just talk about one of the... F oh, so thanking these people. Um, as I mentioned, noise can actually help you in two ways. One, it makes you form the pattern quicker. And two, 
it makes you produce patterns outside the Turing, normal Turing domain. So we got um, a student, Linus Schumacher, who's now doing his DPhil in the CMB, the WCMB, to have a look at that idea of what other things that noise could do for us. And he found that it actually can, in, in certain, so again, this is the Schnackenberg system, where you can have not only oscillations in the background pattern, so here we have a Hopf Turing bifurcation, this is oscillating up and down, but you also have pattern formation. So here we have a peak, here we have a peak on this side, and here we have a peak on that side again. And the spectrum tells you exactly what's happening. We have a peak in the zeroth mode that tells you you're going to expect oscillations. And we also have a smaller power in mode one that tells you it's trying to form a peak. In the average and analytical spectra, as you can see, they do well, they correspond very nicely. So this is just the one spectra of this solution. This is the analytical and average spectra over 1,000 runs. Again, you see that you have oscillations on the background and it should be trying to form a pattern. But if you do this deterministically, you don't get anything. No oscillation, no pattern. What, uh, not quite true. What happens is you get an oscillation to hom hom homogeneity. So you get a transient pattern, but it goes to homogeneity, or at least tries to. It, the noise is able to amplify that pattern consistently for all time. The final thing was, could we derive the time for the polarity switching? Because we have a temporal transform, can we pull out how often the, uh, p uh, the polarity switches? And the answer is yes. For any individual simulation, we can find there is a peak in the spectrum for mode one at a certain time. So this will say that our, p uh, our polarity will switch with this frequency. But that is only for one uh, simulation. On average, each, any individual peak will get smoothed out. And so in the average spectrum, we don't have a dominant polarity switching time length. So again, this is another question that I still really have. What is controlling that time scale? I don't, I, I, I don't know. Here again, it's just another open question because the analytical spectra and the, as you see, the average one, it just simply says that your dominant mode should be zero. But here in, in, in an individual uh, simulation, you can get uh, a non-zero peak. Um, that does bring me to the end. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I've been Thomas Woolley and that was Power Spectra Methods for Stochastic Reaction Diffusion Growing on Domains. <laughs>